Glory to God.
Wow, we all should be feeling pretty good after that, right? I love praising God. I love a good beat. Amen, amen, and amen. God is good. He is here today. So whatever your need is here today, he's here to meet it, that need. The songs we sang today were about never forgetting. And you would think that this sermon maybe would be more apropos for 9-11 or some other occasion, but that's not what we're here to remember today. As the day of Christ's return is quickly approaching, we see that evil in this world escalating. Anybody notice that? Yeah. Yep, get up in the morning. This morning you hear that, you know, people were shot in Kennywood. You can't even go to a amusement park and get away from it. How sad is that? You know, these, these parks in Pittsburgh, they have to have police around them when these little kids play t-ball because the gangs and stuff move in and that's where they have their battles around these little kids. That's really sad. This should not surprise us because in 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 7, it tells us exactly how these things will be. And I'm not here today to speak about those things. God wants you and me to remember that no matter what we see, hear, or feel, that he is still on the throne. Yes. yes, we as Christians say this a lot of times, but God wants us to know and believe this and never forget who he is. We're going to look at a couple accounts in the Bible of people that didn't forget because we know what happened to them that did forget. How many times did the Israelites end up in, back in captivity because they didn't remember who God was? How about waiting 40 years in the wilderness and having a whole generation die because you did not believe who God was? So there are consequences to us when we don't believe God and who he is. Whether Because we know that the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Does he steal your peace? Does he steal your joy? Does he kill all the good stuff that God put in you? Is he stealing your talents and your time with things that are of this world when we know that this world is just a drop in the bucket at the time that we're here. It's but a vapor. To never forget and to live out like Joseph in the Old Testament. At 17, he was betrayed by his brothers and sold into slavery. He finds favor with Potiphar and was raised to a high position in his home only to be lied about by Potiphar's wife because he would not sleep with her. He would not compromise his faith and integrity, which could have cost him his life, but the hand of God moved, and Potiphar just cast him into prison. In prison, he helps two other prisoners out with dreams that they had, and they promised to, they, would tell the, they would tell the higher-ups about him, and they forgot him. When the time was right, we know from the account of the Word of God that one of them would remember Joseph. He is once again raised up, but this time to the second-in-command over the whole nation, not just a household. He is once again over... Um, this did not happen overnight, though. He was sold into slavery at 17, and he didn't get released from that prison until he was 30. He would not be reunited and have relationships with his family for approximately another seven to nine years. With Joseph, we see he was betrayed, lied about, and forgotten, among everything else that happened to him. Yet, he never forgot the dreams he had, and he was working and believing God that they would come to fruition. Because of his faithfulness, God not only restored those wasted years with his family because he came back, but the betrayal, lies, and what seemed to be wasted years in prison turned into a blessing bigger than Joseph could ever imagine. His relationships with his families were restored. His name was known and respected throughout the land. Remember, he was lied about, but this time through, he, he had nobody could say a bad thing about him. And he was wealthier and greater than at any time in his life he ever was. He sums it up by saying this in Genesis 5.20. But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. In order to bring about it as, as this, to this day, so many people would be saved. Praise God for his word in that. So we see the enemy doesn't have to win, even when it looks like he's winning. We can overcome. We just have to trust in God. And a lot of it's a time thing. 
we're not very good waiting. You know, we stand there and watch that microwave 50 seconds for a cup of tea, and we're like, would you come on? Come on now. You know, let's go back to when you had to, like, put some wood in the stove, get the wood going first, and then put that tea pot. I'm telling you, you got a cup of tea probably an hour after you started the whole process, and we're complaining about 50 seconds. Um, we just became that kind of a society. Rush, 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 rush. And, you know, around, um, around our, just where I live out within probably four miles from where I live, in the last four days, there have been several major accidents where people have died. And I look at those and I think, okay, what was the speed limit on that road? I mean, people were just in such a hurry to get everywhere. Where are we rushing to, people? Is it someplace that really matters that much? Guess what? If you're rushing to work and you get into an accident, you're not going to make it to work. Yeah. That's worse than being late. Yeah. <laughs> Plus, you have all these other problems to come on top of that. So we do things sometimes that, in doing them, make an issue worse than if we would just slow down. We're going to look at one more account in the word. Mordecai. Mordecai was a Jew from the tribe of Benjamin. He took Esther in when her mother and father died. When King Hazarus, queen, when King Hazarus, queen, embarrassed him in front of all his cronies, and I'm just going to say that that way because that's probably what they were, um, he dethroned her because she embarrassed him in front of him. So he was looking for a new queen. So Mordecai, knowing that um, his young um, niece, I would think it was his niece, he, she was beautiful, so he had her go and apply for that position. Well, we, we can see in Esther 2.17, it reads, And the king loved Esther above all the women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set a royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Ashti. Around that time, the king also promoted Haman. Now, Haman was a very greedy, devious, evil man. When Haman would, would come to the gate of the city where the men sat and talked, they would all bow to him because he got promoted. But Mordecai would not. Because Mordecai, I think he knew exactly who Haman was. It isn't biblically clear why he didn't bow. It doesn't say anywhere in there, but I think God gave him discernment to know who this man truly was. So Haman presents, he gets upset with this. This really irks him. I mean, it irks him bad to the point where, like, he gets crazy about it, and he plots to have not just Mordecai killed, but the whole Jewish nation, all the Jews that are there. So... Mordecai finds this out, and he's just devastated, you know. What does he do, though? He doesn't quit believing God. He calls and rallies his prayer warriors, his troops, because we have seen and unseen armies in our lives. Mordecai comes up with a, a counter, um, okay, Mordecai comes up with a counterattack, so to speak, by having... Queen Esther go to the king. So they, he, he says, if you can just go to the king. But we have to understand in those days, even though she was the queen, she could not go to the king unless he called for her. If she did, and he didn't put out his golden scepter to her, then she would be killed. And his uncle's argument was this. Well, you either take a chance of getting killed that way, or we're all going to die anyways. Because eventually somebody's going to find out that you're Jewish, and they're going to kill you. Because once a decree is made by a king back in those days, it couldn't, be, it couldn't be undone. Once he put that seal on there, it couldn't be undone. So she requests and prepare a meal for the king and Haman, and Haman runs home and he brags about it to his wife. I can just see this. I can just see his face. He's so excited. The queen asked for me and the king to have dinner to all of us together. She wants me as a special guest. And so he's going on and rattling on and all the things he got when he got his promotion to his wife. He goes on and on and on about it. But then he comes to the end of that conversation with her and her and he says, do you know what? That Mordecai guy still will not bow before me. And I, can see, I just can't stand it. And his wife, you know, being the helpmate that she is, that's okay, honey, because they're going to kill all the Jews anyways. But because it bothers you so much, I think you should build this great big gallow so high that when that day comes, 
You can hang Mordecai up there, and everybody can see him up there and watch him die. I mean, she's a good helpmate. She's just as evil as he is. So while he was busy doing that, God was working. God was working behind the scenes there. We're going to go to Esther, so now you get to open your Bible so, and get it out because we're going to be in it quite a bit here now. Go to Esther. She has her own book. It's right by Job. It's before Job. Go to chapter 6. And we're going to take a couple minutes and we're just going to read this because this I can't even, uh, I could give you my reader's digest version, but the Bible's version is so much better. On that night, could not, the king couldn't sleep. So this is what happened. God's working. Even though all that evil seems like it's going to win and the Jewish nation is going to be destroyed, God is working. On that night, could not, the king could not sleep. He commanded to bring the record of the books of Chronicles and they were read before the king. And it was found written that Mordecai had told of Begathia and Teresh, two of the king's chamberlains, the keepers of the door, who sought to lay hand on the king. They wanted to assass assassinate him. And the king said, What honor and dignity hath been done to Mordecai for this? So then said the king's servants that ministered to him, Nothing's been done for him. And the king said, Who is in the court? And he said, now Haman has come into the outer court of the king's house to speak unto the king to hang Mordecai on the gallows he had prepared for him. So Mordecai is gleefully coming in the court. He is all set to tell the king that he's going to hang Mordecai. And the king's servant said unto him, behold, Haman standeth in the court. And the king said, well, since he's there, bring him in. Bring him in. I need to talk to somebody. So Haman came in, and the king asked him this question. What shall be done unto the man whom the king delighteth to honor? Now, Haman, it's all about Haman, let me tell you. He thinks in his heart, ah, to whom would the king delight to honor more than myself? He has enough vanity for everybody. And Haman answered the king, for the man whom the king delight to honor, he said, let the royal apparel be brought which the king used to wear, and the horse that the king rideth upon, and the, royal, and the crown royal which is set upon his head. And let this apparel and the horse be delivered to the hand of the one of the king's most noble princes, that they may array the man with whom the king delighteth to honor, and bringeth him on the horseback through the city streets, and proclaim him. Thus it shall be done to the man whom the king delighteth to honor. See, he's envisioning this. He's envisioning all these clothes on him. He's envisioning himself on this horse. And he's envisioning going through the town and everybody's seeing him, right? Then the king says to Haman, make haste then. Take the apparel and the horse as thou hast said and do so to Mordecai the Jew that sitteth at the king's gate. Let nothing fail of all that has been spoken. Do you see Haman's jaw hit the floor? Come on, go there with me, because, like, I'm a visual person, so I just see his fault. They had to, like, they had to come over with a dustpan and scoop it up and put it back up, because he, I mean, he was just. Then Haman took the apparel and the horse and arrayed Mordecai and brought him on the horse back through the street of the city and proclaimed before him, Thus shall it be done unto the man whom the king delights to honor. Do you know this killed him more than anything else? I mean, you, God couldn't have done a better plan than this to get back at Haman for his treacherousness. Mordecai came again to the king's gate, but Haman hasted to his house, mourning and having his head covered. Um, and, then, and then there's, so then the, uh, the, the banquet happens and stuff, and um, the truth is revealed as to what was going on. And of course, we find out that Haman and all his household were gone. And who got hung on the gallows? Amen. Haman. He built his own death trap. Yes, he did. Does, is God good? Does he not just know exactly what's going on and how to take the scenario that seems like it's the end of the world and turn it around? So those are two instances we see there. So it came back to bite him in the butt. We are going to go through things in our lives, and some of them are going to come at us so fast that it's going to blindside us. 
These are weapons from the enemy, and they can, look, they can take all forms. It can take an illness. It can take a financial thing. It could take the loss of a loved one. Uh, it could take a, a lo the loss of life as you once knew it. It could do a lot of things. It could be a, a mental thing, a physical thing. It could be whatever. But the enemy knows our time is short, people. And he's pulling out all the stops because it says in the word that if possible in the end times, even the elect would be deceived. If he can get us away from the word of God and he can get us away from each other, then we are in trouble. That is why it says do not forsake the fellowship of the brethren because we need each other. We need each other's backs. We need each other's prayers. We need to hold each other up and we need to hold each other accountable. Amen. 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 So a friend of mine pointed out something that we as followers of Christ all know. This is my friend Carol. God puts people in your life sometimes to speak little words of wisdom to you, and they all of a sudden come on like light bulbs bigger than ever. In Isaiah 54, 17, it reads, No weapon formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment shall be condemned. This is the heritage of the Lord, and their righteous, the, the, their righteous of me, the rightness of me, saith the Lord. Her point was this. Because I've been going through some stuff the last couple of months that has been very, um, it's, let's put it this way, it's waters I've never navigated before. And they're rough waters. They've been very rough. At times I thought that the waves would overtake me, but God is good and those he put in my life are good and they've been praying for me. And when I couldn't bob up and down anymore or tread water anymore, they grabbed my, they threw me a lifeline and it has sustained me. But her point was this. It doesn't say no weapon will be formed against you. Or that no weapon will be used against you. Uh -huh. Come on. It says no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Yes. So we can expect to have weapons formed against us and we can expect mm -hmm. them to hit home. But God will not stand for his children to lose that which he has blessed us with. Amen. This we will never forget that God is on the throne. This we will never forget. He has never lost a battle, and he never will. He's not going to start now. We're not going to be the exception to the rule. He's going to win. So what do we do when the weapons being formed against us seem to be winning? How do we handle that as Christians? We never forget. We never forget that, first of all, that God, God will fight for us. Exodus 14.14 14 says, The Lord shall fight for you, and you should hold your peace. Now, if you're going through something, you take and you take your Bible, take out the little word you, and you put your name in there. The Lord shall fight for Kathy, Amen. and I shall hold my peace, because the enemy comes to steal that peace, and I don't need to talk about stuff. I can keep quiet, because God's working for me. Did you ever go in or, or watch any of those movies where there's attorneys and stuff? But they come in, and they sit down, and they're across from the other attorney and stuff, and they're asking them questions, or the police are asking them a question, and, and the, the uh, lawyer will be like, mm, don't say nothing, you know? I mean, that's how kind of God is. God says, mm, don't say nothing. Because remember, the enemy only knows what you're going through and how you're handling it by what we speak. He don't know what's going on in your mind. So we can't let him know. We need to hold our peace. The only thing we should be speaking is the promises of God. And who he is in his word. We must never forget that he has placed armies in our lives, seen and unseen. Second Kings 6, 15 through 17. And when the servant of the man of God had risen early and gone forth, this is Elisha, and had compassed the city both with horses and chariots, his servant said to him, Alas, my master, he was very distraught. How shall we do? And he answered, Fear not. For they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elijah prayed and said to the Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire around Elijah. And then the enemy didn't even know what hit him when it hit him. We don't have the privilege most times of seeing those armies. But God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Those armies are there fighting for us. And, he, and we have a cheering section. In Hebrews it says, 
Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the, that sin which doth easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Can you see them as a cheering section up there? Elijah, Elijah, Enoch, Methuselah, or, you know, um, Melchizedek. Can you see them up there as our little cheering section? And then when, we get, when our knees get kicked out from under us, they all go, oh, in unison. You know, like when your favorite football player, when he drops the ball, everybody goes, oh. And they're like, but they get right back up and they rally for us. They're rallying for us. You have somebody rallying for you. Not just your friends and not just the people in the church. We have a whole cloud of witnesses rallying for us. So when you start to go through something, don't quit. Don't give them a reason to go, oh, she took that one hard. I think, is she going to get back up? I don't know if she's going to get back up from that one, but we hope she's going to get back up from that one. Well, maybe we just got to send somebody into her life, get a little word of, of encouragement. Yeah, send somebody, have her send a text to her, get her up off that ground. But God will use people in our lives to help do that, to get us back up again. So thank you, Jesus, for that. So God will fight for us. And he has placed armies in our lives, seen and unseen. And if you don't know what your seen army is, it's this. He's, every part of body he's placed in your life that encourages you, that prays for you. He uses ungodly people to bless you. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, he does. Yes, he does. They might love you and find favor with you and have nothing to do with God, and you come into an issue, and all of a sudden they're like, hey, I know somebody that can do that for you, or I know somebody, or I know, I know. God puts them people in our lives. They become part of the army. They didn't even know that they were deployed for us. All right, they have no idea, but it's okay. They got drafted, and they didn't know they got drafted by God. Hopefully, they'll find out someday. The next thing we're going to have to do is, first, to never forget, we're going to have to wait on the Lord. Um, go to Daniel 10, 11 through 13. Old Testament. Prophet. Mm -hmm. uh, 10, 11 through 13. You're welcome. So Daniel has been waiting for an answer from the Lord. Sometimes in life we're waiting for answers, and it seems like God doesn't hear us. But there's proof that God hears us. But sometimes the battle that goes on that we can't see out there yeah. is so intense that the answer, blink, the answer um, doesn't come when we expect it. We have to wait on it. And there is proof here. It says, then he said to me, this is an angel, fear not, Daniel. This is coming from God. From the first day that you did set your heart to understand and to chasten thyself before God, thy words were heard, and I have come for thy words. I heard you pray. I heard you the first day you, you called out to me. I heard your prayers. I'm not lax that I didn't hear you. He said, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. Lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the king of Persia. Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days, for yet the vision is for many days. But there was a battle going on. 21 days before that answer could get through. How many days has it been since you've been praying for a loved one that's not saved? How many days has it been since your healing hasn't come yet? How many days are you going to wait on the Lord? He heard you the first day you said something about it. He says, wait on me. Sometimes it's something that we learn as we go through life. Sometimes, like Paul said, you know, it's because of my infirmity keeps me humble. So sometimes we don't get rid of stuff because if we did, we may become a little vain and we may not be who God wants us to be. In Psalms 27, 14, it says, wait upon the Lord, be of good courage and he will strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. There's a lot of scriptures in here, especially in, in the Psalms, about waiting on the Lord. There's a reason for that. It's because we have to learn to wait on the Lord. Another thing we must never forget is to trust that God has your best interests at heart, even when you can't see the outcome of your situation or circumstances. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 reads, and you guys can probably quote this with me, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. 
We don't understand why things happen. And sometimes, I don't know, is anybody out there a chess player? I know that's a dying art. My, my dad raised us to play chess. And when you play chess, you're always thinking three moves ahead. Because you, you want to make a move, and if that person makes the move you think they might make, or whatever, or they don't take your spot, then you know where you're going to go for the next move. That's how you play. Well, God's like a thousand steps ahead. Amen. All right? Uh, and I think, of him, I think of him as a master chess player because he moves this person here and moves that person there and has these two people come together across you know, meet over here, and then this happens and this happens. And, you know, sometimes it's not till we're through a, a heavy battle that we see how everything clicked into place. But God knew way ahead of time. He already knew what was going to happen. And then in Romans it says, and we know, 828, we know that all things work together to those that love the Lord, to, whom, to them who are called according to his purpose. He loves us and he is working out the things for good. Sometimes we can't see it, folks. Sometimes not for a really, really long time. We just got to hold on. We can't quit. I mean, once again, look at Joseph, 17 to almost 40 year, 30 years old. That's a long span to be waiting for something. Let's look at um, Caleb and, and Joshua. Forty years till they could see the promise, but they didn't quit. So we need to be encouraged by the accounts of these people in Scripture because God put them there for a reason, because he would know we would need them. What can we do when the, epi when the weapons of the enemy have been deployed or they strike us? How can we stand firm and strong in these days and the days that are coming? First of all, be in the word daily. Let's go to Psalms. We're going to go to Psalms 119. You want a long book to read or chapter? Read, read 119. But it's all about God's word. It's all about God's word. Go to 119, and we're going to read 1 through 6. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. The law of the Lord is not the old law. It is in, his, in, in the whole Bible, the law. It is his word. And blessed are they that keep his t testimonies, which is the word, and that seek him with their whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. Thou hast commanded us to keep the precepts diligently. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep the statutes. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all the commandments. Flip over to um, 89, uh, same, bo same, cha um, same chapter, 119, but go to 89 through 93. It says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. This word has been settled in heaven. The, faithful the faithfulness is unto all generations. The faithfulness found in this book is to all generations. And that means you and me also. Thou hast established the earth and it abideth. They continue this day according to thine ordinances for they are thy servants. Unless the law had been my delights, I should have perished in mine affliction. This held him through. Otherwise, he says, he would have perished. I will never forget thy precepts for thou hast quickened them in me. He'll never forget. We're never to forget this word. That's why you need to memorize scriptures. Every storm I go through, I add to my repertoire of scriptures. And it seems like I never can go back to the ones I already know. <laughs> God says, nope, I want you to learn new ones. It's a new book. It's a new battle. It's a new situation. I want you to memorize new scriptures. Because scriptures help get me through things. And I can't, find, I can't memorize real long ones a lot of times, but that's okay with God. He says, just memorize this one and you'll be okay. All right? But if you're real good at memorizing, like I know people that have memorized books in the Bible, uh, not me. <laughs> the second one, we're going to look up Ephesians. Go to Ephesians 6. I know I'm having you flip all over the place today. You're getting to know your Bible. It's a good thing. This is your best buddy. It has everything you need to navigate through life. Second thing we need to do is we need to armor up daily. I once heard a pastor say that once you armor up, it's good for life. I disagree. I believe that every day we need to be reminded of the armor that we're putting on and why we're putting it on. 
And I think we should say it out loud so the enemy knows that we're getting dressed for battle today. All right? And God is the one who will be protecting us today. So enemy, Satan, hello. I'm just giving you a heads up. Today I'm getting dressed in my battle garment. God's going to protect me. He's going to guide my paths. He's the chief commander. So that's what you're dealing with today. It says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, which we're in, and having done all, stand, stand therefore, having your loins skirt about with the truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, and above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. It's for all of us. We're all in that army. We're all in that battle. We need to armor up every day. And then the next thing you need to do, so we're going to be in the Word, right? Because the enemy's flinging stuff at us left and right. Um, we're going to armor up daily, and then we're going to take control of our thoughts. Every moment of every day. I am preaching to myself here, okay? So if you get something out of it, God bless you. But it was for me when God had me studying this. Every moment of every day, from the moment I get up off my pillow to the moment I close my eyes at night and I drift off into sleep, I have to take control of my thoughts. If I don't, the enemy loves to handle them for me and take me to places I cannot go and have any kind of peace. In Philippians 4, 6 through 9, it says, be, be careful, which means anxious, for nothing, but in everything, and by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, make your requests made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, the one true thing we have in our lives is our relationship with God and his unchanging word. If you need to think about something and you don't have anything else good to think about, you think about what is true. Whatsoever things are honest. This means just the facts. Um, I, so there's some older people in here, so this may work for you. But um, uh, <laughs> my therapist, because um, I was in an accident a couple months ago, and um, because of that, I developed PTSD from it. And I'm, I'm in some counseling, and that's okay. It's all good. We're good, right? I mean, this is my main counselor, but God also puts other people in our lives, okay? It's cool. It's cool. Um, I'm not in a nutball. My husband might say I'm a nutball, but, you know, that may differ, but uh, he's, he's, <laughs> he's put up with a lot with me the last couple months. Um, but just the facts. She says to me, did you ever watch Dragnet? So if you're a little older, you might have watched Dragnet. It was a police TV show. And the one gentleman who was a policeman, he would go to interview somebody, and they might be, the one lady would be like, well, blah, 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 this happened, and then blah, 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 this happened. And he'll be like, ma'am, calm down. Just the facts, ma'am. Just the facts. When our mind starts going and playing crazy games with us, we have to say, this is what I do anyways. Just the facts, Kathy. Just the facts. God is. God will. I believe. Like, these are facts. I can go with these facts. Because when we do, if I had only... What if this happens? Our minds are going places that none of that, you can't change what's back there, and you have absolutely no idea what's going to go there. So you're wasting time on both ends. The only thing we can do is concentrate on the here and now and the facts right now. And so if you need that simple little saying, just the facts, ma'am, just the facts, let that be your little thing that pulls you back to the, the solid ground and puts you back your focus on Christ. Two of the scriptures we read today about two different people in their circumstances, it said compassed about, compassed about, surrounded, all right? The, the root word of that is, of course, compass. And I had prayer um, a couple weeks ago here, um, and um, the word compass, keep your eyes focused on Jesus. Always keep your eyes focused on Jesus. That's the only part of that compass you need to worry about. And all the rest will fall into place. 
Whatsoever things are just, innocent, or holy. Some of you have grandkids. Some of you have dogs. Some of you have pets. If you need to think about the fact that your innocent little grandchild is giggling over there and that helps you get through something, then watch your grandchild giggle. I have chickens. I so enjoy going out and feeding my chickens. I, I really do. I know it sounds weird. But we have this new batch of peeps up there, you know, and, and as you introduce new food to them, like we had some old lunch meat, we introduced that to them the other day. And first they didn't want it, but then once they found out what it was, oh my gosh, they're stealing it off of each other. And one will steal it and run over here, and there's two chasing that one, and somebody else is chasing it. And it's just fun to watch. So, you know, sometimes we just need to do silly, simple things and find pleasure in them because it's just innocent. Whatever things are pure, they're modest, perfect, chaste, or clean, think about these things. Whatever things are lovely. When you think about that, a lot of times you think, oh, a lovely person or a lovely flower, but whatever things are acceptable. You know, God put a lot of acceptable things in the Word. He talks about his creation and all this stuff. There are things that we can think about that are lovely. Whatever things are of good report, meaning reputable. So if you're glued to your TV, turn it off. All right, just turn it off. Because the good report is not reputable on there. God's word is reputable. If there be any virtue, that means if there's any excellence to anything, God is excellent. And if there be any praise, which means commendable in that particular word, think on these things. Praise. And we know we're supposed to praise him through all of our storms. So it says, think on these things, those things which you've learned. Now you've learned this today, if you're paying attention and haven't fallen asleep. Have you received them, though? And heard and seen in me do, the God of peace shall be with you. And that is who we want in our life, the God of peace. Then never forget who we are in Christ Jesus and because of Christ Jesus. Go to Psalm 121. I like to hear the pages turn, and that's why <laughs> I make you look them up. <laughs> I will lift up my eyes unto the hills from which my help comes. My help cometh from the Lord, which made the heaven and the earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall not slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The Lord shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forward and forevermore. We need to stand on these promises. We need to claim them. This is who God is. Second Peter reads in uh, verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 4, Whereby we are given unto us exceedingly great and precious promises, that by these we might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. God has given us a divine nature when we have Christ living in us. Not only can we escape the world through lust, but we also have all the benefits that go with being a child of the king. Amen. Ephesians 1, 3 through 5. We're going to jump there. The Old Testament, New Testament. You're getting it now. You're here. See, my words really don't matter. Only Jesus' words matter. So I like to spend a lot of time in the word. Um, uh, chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God to the saints, which were Ephesus, to the faithful of Jesus Christ, it says, Grace be to you, and peace from our God, our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ. Another blessing that we are entitled to. I'm not saying we're to abuse it. We see what entitlement does to people in the world when it, when it comes to things and money. It corrupts them. We are not to take this as a right to sin and go do whatever we want or get whatever we want materially. It doesn't, that's not what this is saying. This is saying he gives us these spiritual blessings in heavenly places because he wants to see his kids thriving. He wants to see them enjoying. 
He wants to see them laughing. He wants to see them living lives of peace, even though everything around them is falling apart. This is what he wants for us. And then the last thing I have is we must never forget who our God is. He is Jehovah Jireh, our provider. He is Jehovah Shalom, our peace. He is Jehovah Shema. He is present in every situation and circumstance. He is Jehovah Nissi. He's the banner that goes before us in battle. He is our rear guard. He's El Shaddai, all sufficient, almighty God. He's El Elyon, Lord who sees, Lord most high. El Roy, the God who sees. Jehovah Rapha, he's our healer. He's our comforter. He's the chief cornerstone on which faith is built and cannot be shaken. He's Abba, our father. He is Alpha and Omega. He's the ancient of days. The I am that I am. He's a savior, redeemer, bread of life, king of kings, counselor, mighty God, prince of peace, master, Emmanuel, mediator, judge, lamb of the rock, solid rock, and bridegroom and the lion of Judah. So, knowing that, what circumstance do you have today that those names of God did not cover? Do you need comforted today because you lost a loved one, or you lost a job, or you lost a friend? I know people that like have really close friends, and they've just said something weird has happened, and they're not friends anymore, and it leaves a hollow spot there. Do you need comforted today? He says, I'm the comforter. Do you need healed today? He says, I'm your healer. Do you need a lion to go attack the enemy. I am, he says, I'm the Lion of Judah. He can do that for you. Do you need some counseling with your mind? He is the great counselor. He's mighty God. If you've never been saved and you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, do you need him today as Savior, Savior so you can be redeemed and you too can be brought into the family of God? Do you need that today? Do you need him to be with you, Emmanuel, God with us? Are you going through a situation and you think God doesn't see you? Well, let me tell you, when Hagar was ill in the wilderness, she named him El Roy, God who sees, because in that circumstance in her life, she was at her end. She was at her end, and God showed up. He's the God of the midnight hour. Sometimes he don't come early when we want him to come, and he doesn't come in the middle either. He doesn't come till that very last second. So guess what? He gets all the glory. That's right. He is our Father. He loves us. He is our Father. He loves us. Do you need peace today in your life? Are you struggling with maybe not being able to, to sleep or else, you know, your mind races with things? You go places, your mind goes places. You don't need it to go because, like, again, the what ifs. If I had only and what if. We don't want to waste our time there because that, that is just waste of time. We can't worship God. And the enemy loves to keep us there. He is the I am that I am in the ancient of days. God, nothing got past him. He knows all the enemy's tricks, every single one of them. So we're going to end with a song today. And if you need God in any of these forms, or you feel like you're just being beat up like crazy by the devil, because I'm going to tell you what, in the end times we're going to be. And if you're not being beat up, then just praise God you're right now in that season, because it's coming. I hate to tell you that it's coming. You're not going to get off the hook. And if you're not doing it and, you've, and you're around for a lot longer and nothing still happens, then I think maybe you need to talk to Jesus because maybe you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. Because if you are, the enemy's coming after you. All right? We do get seasons of rest. God does give us seasons of rest. But when we're plugging for the Lord, let me tell you, they don't last usually very long. And then he comes at us again. And but once again, we've got that shield. we got that sword right here, and the enemy has already been put under his feet. We are the victors. Go in Revelations and find out every time it says to him who overcomes. Highlight them. When you get into a battle and you feel like you're just about to quit, you just want to about jump ship, go in your Revelations and look at all the highlighters, things you've highlighted about to him who overcome. You'll get excited because when we become, we're, not, we're overcomers, we have all those, with every overcomer, there says in there, there's a promise that goes with it. He's going to give you a new name. You're going to rule and reign with him. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. So go and revelate. That's your homework assignment. I'm not going to check and see if you did it, but if you do it, I know that you'll be happier. <laughs> but if you need prayer for any of these things, the enemy's beating you up. You just feel like you're tired, you're weary, and you just need a new, fresh impartation of the Holy Spirit to give you a jump start. Um, let a brother or sister pray with you and do that for you. 
They'll play, we'll be up here, Thomas and Ron and um, Brother, what? Greg, Greg, yes. Would you come up and pray too for people? Good, 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 I knew you would. Um, but come up, don't be bashful, don't be shy. Um, I've had great, great breakthroughs myself at the altar. I really love the altar. Um, I feel more at home there than some other places in, my, in the world, a lot more home, and I think that's a good thing. Uh, it's, not, it's not a thing to be ashamed of. There's been seasons in my life where I've come up every week for like six weeks and, and cried my heart out. Nothing to be ashamed about. God says, I'm here for you, and you know my saints are going to back you, and that's why we come here. And that's why we come up here, because it says we're supposed to share one another burdens, as well as rejoice with each other. So if something good happens, don't hesitate to tell a brother or sister something good happened, and it's God. God did this for me. Share the glory. Share, don't just keep it to yourself. You know, we get these prayer requests going on different things, and we hear about all the prayers, but I never hear about any answers. And I know there have to be answers. So share the answers. They're always good. They keep us going. All right, I'm just going to go ahead and you can play the music. and I'm just going to ask, Lord, if there's anybody in here today, the Father God needs that touch.